Welcome to The Drum Shuffle, a podcast offering insights, perspectives, and conversations for drummers. I'm your host, Jamie Eads. Hey, how's it going out there, everybody? Welcome to the Drum Shuffle Podcast. Jamie Eads joining you as I do each and every week. This is episode 152. I hope everybody's having a great week out there in Drumland. Uh, I just got back from vacation. It was much needed. Got a little bit of R&R in. Uh, Our daughter was on her fall break, and we took a little short cruise down to the Bahamas. Uh, I got my last bit of sunshine and and beach time in for the year. Uh, It is turning cold. Uh, Fall has officially arrived here at the Drum Shuffle World Headquarters, Uh, but I hope all of you guys are doing well and staying healthy out there. We have a great episode today. Uh, I'm so excited about this one. I'm going to be joined in just a moment by the great Dennis Dykin from the Smithereens. I've been such a fan for so many years. Uh, I was just absolutely thrilled to be able to get him on the show. So uh, we'll be right back with Dennis uh, right after this message from our sponsor, Los Cabos Drumsticks. The best kept secret for drummers is finally out. Los Cabos Drumsticks may look like the sticks you grew up with, but these are not your father's drumsticks. Los Cabos Drumsticks is Canada's number one drumstick brand, and they are coming to a retailer near you. With operations in over 28 countries worldwide, thousands of drummers have already discovered the Los Cabos difference. Using FSC certified wood from Canada and the U.S., Los Cabos make the finest quality drumsticks, percussion tools, and accessories on the market. The best news, Los Cabos Drumsticks offers you a ton of choice. They have 22 individual drumstick models and 14 percussion tools, many of which are available in three different wood types, maple, white hickory, and red hickory. Red hickory comes from the center, or heart, of the hickory tree and has been independently proven to be both stronger and more elastic than white hickory without adding a lot of weight. While most drumstick manufacturers have shunned red hickory, Los Cabos Drumsticks has embraced it, becoming the only established stick brand in the world to offer a full line of red hickory drumsticks. To learn more about Los Cabos Drumsticks, visit them online at loscabosdrumsticks.com, follow them on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and don't forget to ask for Los Cabos Drumsticks at your favorite retailer. Dare to be different. Join the Red Hickory Revolution with Los Cabos Drumsticks. All right, guys and girls, as I mentioned before the break, we're going to be joined by the great Dennis Dykin of the Smithereens here in just a moment. Um, I want to set this up a little bit by saying uh, we had this conversation back at the end of September, uh, right as uh, Hurricane Ian was attacking Florida and the East Coast. Uh, So you'll hear some reference to that. Um, But I I was so excited to be able to get Dennis on the show. Um, I've been such a fan of the Smithereens for so many years. And Dennis and I briefly met in the early 90s uh, for maybe 40 seconds or so. Uh, And and of course, he he didn't remember that. Um, You know, it was just a kind of a chance meeting backstage at a gig. Um, but I, I was excited to get him on um, the Smithereens. Uh, if you followed the history of the band, of course they're still out there playing. Um, but they lost uh, Pat Denizio a, a few years ago, uh, tragically, uh, sadly, and we all miss him very much. But uh, the band has released an album that was recorded back in 1993, and they're calling it the Lost Album. Uh, with Pat on vocals uh, and guitar. Uh, So we were talking a a lot about that, and it's a really cool record. And if you dig the Smithereens and and any of their stuff, you're going to love that record, Uh, and you should go out and grab a copy immediately. Uh, Don't pass go. Don't collect $200. It's a fantastic record. Um, But I I was just 
thrilled to get Dennis on the show again. Uh, and we had such a great conversation and it's very wide ranging. We talk about a lot of stuff here, uh, but Dennis is just a wealth of information. Uh, I would call him an honorary musicologist. Uh, he understands the history of music, the history of rock and roll, uh, and, and he's just a great guy. So please help me welcome to the Drum Shuffle podcast, Dennis Dykin. Hey, good afternoon, Dennis. How's it going, man? Well, it's going pretty good. Uh, I'm in New Jersey. The weather is uh, pretty nice here, uh, which I guess uh, is not necessarily the case in all of the eastern seaboard right now. <laughs> There's a hurricane going on, but is that affecting you? That's not affecting you, is it? No, we may get some rain out of it. You know, I'm in central Kentucky and they're, you know, my daughter's away at school in North Carolina. So, you know, they're talking like we might get some pretty nasty rain over the weekend. So just in time to ruin your weekend plans, um, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But really, uh, you know, thinking about all of our uh, folks down in Florida and Georgia and South Carolina, it's, it's really nasty. Yeah. So, um, oh, yeah, I could send good, I'd like to send good wishes there and, uh, just, uh, relaxing here in the weather in New Jersey, which is okay. So. Yeah, for sure, man. For sure. Well, listen, I, I want to thank you, uh, before we get going, uh, I, I just want to say thanks for taking time to come on the drum shuffle podcast. Um, you know, I've been such a fan of the smithereens for, so many years and I, you know i want to say the first time i saw you guys was early 90s probably 91 92 i'm guessing you guys mm. played a um memorial day festival in lexington kentucky and a couple of buddies of mine um were in one of the opening acts so it, we we actually met that day just briefly you know it was just kind of a hey nice to meet you kind of thing um mm -hmm. but you know i had heard some of the songs but the live performance absolutely knocked my socks off you guys were playing like there was no tomorrow and it was amazing well Thank you. Uh, that's what we try to do at every show, believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> right. It, 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 honestly, we, we don't, uh, it's just what we do. We don't think about it too much, but I keep saying, well, you know, we've been doing a lot of interviews to promote this new album and um, this new Lost album. And it just uh, occurs to me that Jimmy, and I, Jimmy, Babjack and I are doing a lot of interviews together, and he and I met in high school, you know, and we still play like we're teenagers. We still have the enthusiasm. I'm, I'm not blowing smoke. We really do. We, we, our main objective, of course, is to play well, but more than that is to have fun, and that spills over, and the audience gets it, and they, uh, that's what keeps them coming back, you know, we're we're entertainers and we do our best to help people forget their troubles for a couple hours, you know? Yeah. And you know, I mean, I think I've, I've heard you reference a couple of times, you know, the, the, the Genesis of the band, I, you guys first started touring way back in, uh, 86, 85, 86, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I've heard mm -hmm. you reference the fact that, you know, um, a lot of your fans from those early years were in college when you were doing a lot of college shows. And now those folks, you know, are kind of empty nesters and they're coming back to the shows, which has got to be just an amazing feeling as an artist, right? It is because look, in March of 23, it's going to be our 43rd anniversary. As a band. <laughs> Wow. So to know that we can do this for so many years and still have meaning in people's lives. Uh, yeah, that's extremely gratifying. Um, cause we're just doing what we would do anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Uh, it, it's just what we like to do, but we couldn't do it if, if we didn't have an audience and we are grateful to the law for the loyalty and the staying power of our, our fan base. And we've made a lot of good friends and we've 
seen the world and it's just because people like what we do and you know, what yeah. can I say? It's the gift. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely is. And you know, I, I'm in a, a, not exactly the same situation, but a similar situation in that I still play in the band that I was playing in when I was 13 years old. You, you know what really? I mean? Yeah. Like all of my best friends from middle school, we formed a band. We, we did okay for a while, came close, you know, the, the, the whole story. Um, but you know, we've had families and, you know, raising our kids, but we still manage to get together and, and make a joyful noise every now and then. And we do a few shows every year. But that's been, you know, kind of my touchstone for my entire playing career. And for mm-hmm. you to have that with these guys that you went to to school with, and and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't you and, and Mike go to, like, grammar school together? Well, that's correct. Yeah, I've known Mike since um, 65, 1966, something like that. Yeah, wow. we, we grew up together. Mind you, he wasn't playing bass at that time. He did that later, but he, he was studying accordion when he was a kid, as did Jimmy, which I think is really good musical grounding. But uh, yeah, there's some real deep, deep roots in this brotherhood we call the Smithereens. It really is like a family. Yeah, man. Well, and then, you know, I mean, I, I, I guess kind of the, the as the story goes, um, I don't know if it was, you know, the three of you guys that placed an ad or if Pat is the one that placed an ad, but y- you guys kind of all got together with Pat and that was the the beginning of the smithereens, right? Yeah. So even dipping back a little further, uh, so yeah, I went to grammar school with Mike. We we just we were good friends and we spent a lot of time together and that was before we were years before we were playing music together. And as it turns out, even see, Jimmy Babjack lived in Carteret, the same town that we lived in, but he just happened to his house happened to be on the other side of the school uh, zone dividing line. So, we didn't go to the same grammar school. However, Mike knew Jimmy a little bit cuz they attended the same church. They made communion together, so they they had at least a passing uh, acquaintance there. Um, and so I, I started teaching myself to play drums when I was real young, like three, four years old. I started banging around and knew that I wanted to do something musically with, with drums. And, um, and I also wanted to be a DJ, but that's a whole other story. But so uh, I got my first drum set when I was 11 and 68. And then I didn't really find many musicians to play with until around 71. I joined a band that didn't last too long. That was summertime. That was right before going into high school. I figured when I go into high school, I'm going to meet a whole bunch of new people that I never knew before. Maybe I could find a guitarist that can play. I can't explain by the who that would be <laughs> right. my, a great starting point. I, I thought so the first day, a freshman year, <laughs> first period, earth science class, in the first row, in the first seat, there's this kid sitting there with kind of like a beetly kind of haircut. And I see he opens, I'm in the second row, he opens up his loose leaf, and there's colored pictures of the hoop from Hit Parader magazine plastered inside his notebook. And I said, it's the first day of freshman year, I said, I got to talk to this kid. So I introduced myself, turns out he played guitar and we started banging around that week. And that's 1971. So, um, I know this is a long answer to your question, but, uh, so we went through high school rehearsing in Jimmy's garage. And then right after high school, Mike noticed, well, Hey, if I want to keep hanging out with these guys, maybe I should pick up an instrument. So he knew we needed a bass player. He learned bass and he got, really good, really quick. Uh, and then we kicked around for a few years, just the three of us, but uh, trying to find a suitable, uh, lead singer. It wasn't easy to find, uh, someone who had the same sensibilities as we did. So, uh, we played around parties and things like that. And then in 1978, we took out an ad looking for a lead singer, didn't have any, uh, good response. And at the same time, I was still 
playing with some other bands here and there, and I, I saw this one ad in the Aquarian, which was uh, still is a real good um, New Jersey entertainment paper. And they had a very thriving musicians classified, uh, and that's how I met. I, I came to know Pat. He placed an ad. He was in a cover band at the time, uh, and they were doing songs by The Who and Elvis Costello, Devo, Buddy Holly, The Jam, and The Beatles. So I thought, well, this is a lot different than the, the cover scene that was happening all over New Jersey. There were, um, it was a, a big market for cover bands. There were, some of these bands worked seven nights a week. You could, there were so many venues and bars. But I'm talking, at the time it was, Southern rock was real big and uh, just a lot of FM rock, Foreigner and, uh, and then the glam bands and the top 40 bands. But this band that Pat was, was playing and was real different. So I thought, well, let me, let me answer this ad. So I found him to be a real interesting cat, cat and uh, played with him in that band for, well, we rehearsed for about six months, did one gig. Then we parted ways. Um, that was 78. And I stayed in touch with Pat in 1980. He called me to play on uh, demos of songs he started writing. And then I brought in Mike and Jim. I said, I, I know some guys who would, who would suit this music very well. And that's how it all came together. That's, that's so amazing. And you, you know, I mean, I just, I, the, the parallel to my, to my own experiences, um, you know, I, I just think maybe we're, we're kindred spirits or something, but you know, it's <laughs> there. I, I try to explain to people and, and maybe you can lend some credence to my thought process here, but I try to explain to people you know, me and the, the guys from Funnel, that was the name of the band, um, we can be apart for three years. And the minute we get into a musical situation, it's as though we played a tour that ended yesterday. And yeah. I try to explain to people there is an unspoken telepathy amongst musicians that grew up and learned together. It's like putting on your favorite pair of jeans. It just fits right. You're right. Um, there's something so special about a musical bond, right? It's um, you could hang out and play pool together, or you can go fishing, or you know, belong to some kind of uh, club together. But the playing music together, it's it's like you're speaking a your own language to each other mm -hmm. and, and, and things are communicated that way on a spiritual level, really. And you're right. It, it's, it's kind of like going to a high school reunion sometimes, not with everybody, but you might run into some people that you were close with back then, or say cousins you haven't seen for a long time. The, when you reconnect with them after being away for a while, there are certain memories and certain experiences that you can only share with those individuals. And, and it is like you, you see them after five years, but you pick up right where you left off. And it's because the roots are so deep, you know, and, uh, it's, uh, there's nothing like it. We we're in touch with other high school friends too, that, uh, that we grew up with that aren't in the band. So yeah, it, it's, that's what life's all about. And it, it really hurts when you lose somebody um, that's close to you. Yeah. Because uh, there are certain memories that you could only share with those specific people, you know. And uh, once they're gone, you still hold those memories dear, but it's, uh, it just, it, it, there's a little tinge of sadness will always be connected to them. But, but you're right. Uh, the musical bond is, uh, there's nothing like it. And you, you can only really understand it if you're in it, I think. Yeah. I mean, I've tried to explain it to, to, you know, other musicians I've played in, you know, dozens of bands over the years, but I always go back to that musical home base with, with those four other human beings, you know, and uh -huh. uh, I've tried to explain to other musicians that are great musicians in their own right. They're like, why don't you sound like that when you play with us? And I'm like, it's, <laughs> I, I can't, 
I can't put it into words, but it's almost like, you know, I've been married to those guys for 30 plus years, you know, and it's just how I grew up. And I think you guys have something very, very similar to that. Just, you know, the case in point, you're about to celebrate 43 years of the smithereens. That's crazy. Yeah. It's really, it's nuts. (laughs) Yeah. But, But you know, I just think that, you know, and I'll get into some of this in just a second, but, you know, I mean, we're coming up on five years since we lost Pat and, you know, what, what a loss that must have been, but, you know, you guys have, you know, never give up. Right. I mean, talk to me a little bit about just the dogged determination of, of the smithereens. Well, it goes back to what I was saying before. We grew up together. There's deep, deep roots. Uh, and we all created this thing together. You know, uh, I often say that if you really want to boil it down, the essence, the sound of the smithereens can uh, occur when, let's say, we're at a sound check and Jimmy hits one chord in that with that unique voicing that he uh, conjures, and I hit a flam on the snare. Well, that one blast is the sound of the smithereens. It's, it's like what you said before. How come if you play with a, another person or another group, of, how come it doesn't sound the same way? Well, everybody has their own voice on their instrument. It's kind of like saying, well, how come if I'm, I'm making spaghetti sauce and the if I don't, if I put basil in instead of thyme, well, it's two different ingredients, you know, it's really the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I, it absolutely is. And, you know, I just, words can't express um, how that works. And, you know, I, I go back to, you know, some sort of unspoken telepathy that, that you just have with that group of people. And, you know, I think that has has always shown in the music of the Smithereens. Um, you know, I, I want to get a little bit into the Lost album and correct any of this that I get wrong because I probably will. But you found, I guess, these master tapes, and this was the record that was done in '93. Right mm-hmm. after you guys, I, I guess, were were dropped by Capitol Records. Right. And then you make this great record that never comes out, and you go on to record another record when you sign with RCA. But mm-hmm. so was there ever any talk, I, and I've, I've never heard you answer this, but in 92, when the capital deal ended, was there any talk of giving up and throwing in the towel at that point? No, no, it just, no, it, it, it just wasn't, it wasn't in the cards. It's, this is, you know, playing is what we do. We, and it's a, like I might've said before, it really is a family. There, there was, as long as there's an audience that comes to see us, there's no reason not to play. I mean, if people didn't come to see us, we'd probably get, still get together and make music. But no, it, it, there was no reason to to uh, entertain such a notion because this is what we do. We, we, we found our, our formula for hanging out together and playing together, and there was no reason... There was no reason to stop. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, you know, when I listen through this, you know, for, first and foremost, this sounds exactly like a Smithereens record. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. You know, mm-hmm. it, it immediately took me back to that place in time, right? Like, I was like, oh, yeah, man, this is a Smithereens record. Um, I'm assuming, you know, that you guys are recording this in 93. Probably a lot of this was done on your own dime, right? Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we had been, we started out our recording career in 1980, mostly in New York City. Our first EP, Girls About Town, and then uh, Beauty and Sadness. With Beauty and Sadness, we started working at the record plant, which is a very uh, historical and renowned uh, 
recording palace. There's so much history there on West 44th Street, no longer there, but we were fortunate to to be in such a hallowed place and work with great people like our engineer, Jim Ball. And we did our first album, especially for you there as well. But when we signed with Capitol, they wanted us to record at the, their facility at the Tower in Hollywood, which was a great experience. And then we continued with Eleven and Blow Up. They were also done in Los Angeles with this group of sessions that were, uh, that uh, yielded the lost album, as it's called. Uh, we decided to stay at home, stay with our families, just drive through the tunnel every day and uh, report to West 19th Street in Manhattan. And uh, and we we just, it was like going to work every day, but work that you really love, you know, but we were very focused and, uh, and we actually recorded two albums worth of material. Uh, we, I guess it was about 24 tracks, maybe give or take. And, um, 12 of those were actually, uh, the earlier versions of songs that were re-recorded and, uh, would eventually comprise the, uh, the songs on uh, a date with the smithereens. So we had, excuse me, we had those. And then we had these 12 other ones left over that uh, just sat in the vault until, uh, until a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Well, that makes a little bit more sense to me then, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, because I was thinking, okay, first came the lost album and then you guys did a date with the smithereens later, but it sounds like they all came from the same sessions essentially. Well, although the songs that were on a date, the ones we did at the studio on West 19th Street, Crystal, they were earlier versions. We re-recorded them when we signed with RCA. Uh, of course, of of course, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, am I understanding that this Lost album is uh, as you found it, so to speak, like, like there were no overdubs, there was no remixing, anything like that. That's absolutely correct. We, um, we did, uh, remaster it, but we could not actually return to the, the multi-tracks because <laughs> tragically there was a big fire at the vault in Brooklyn where they were housed. Oh no. Uh, yeah, we lost a lot of tapes. I think we have safeties on many of the mixes that perished there, but the multis went bye-bye. So, uh, no, we actually uh, we had uh, mixes in our possession of these. So we we just went. We just all, all we did is we just took the tracks, sequenced them, mastered them, put a cover, cover together. Mike wrote some really cool liner notes for it. And put it out. It, uh, we thought, we just thought those twelve songs stood together pretty well, so there wasn't uh, there wasn't a whole lot that went into it. And Greg Calby did a great job mastering it too. Well, it, yeah, I mean, it again, it sounds like a Smithereens record. You know, I mean, it sounds phenomenal, and you know, I I I have been thoroughly enjoying it. It is, um, you know, I, I, how do I want to say this? It runs the gamut, you know, the opening track out of this world sounds very much like a smithereens, uh, you know, rock song. Um, and then you've got some some different stuff on there, too, you know, like uh, face the world with pride. Very uh, Sergeant Pepper esque in my mind anyway, um, mm-hmm. you know, so I, I, I think it does run the gamut of your catalog, but these songs are really, really good. There's a couple where you're on percussion, not playing drums, uh, which I found interesting. And I thought, well, these songs would sound good with drums. Maybe it was a, uh, Hey, we're out of time. We don't have time to do a drum track or something like that. Can you add mm-hmm. any color to that? Uh, that might've been the case. I'd have to really cast my memory back there and I do have some journals from that period Uh, but also we were on some numbers we took the Buddy Holly approach like he would do on Words of Love or Listen to Me uh, where we just 
you know, it, we, it, it, it wasn't broke, so we didn't have to fix it. <laughs> yeah, well, right on. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. I just, you know, I, I found it interesting that, um, you know, the songs are just, they're new, but they're old. Does that make any sense at all, or am I just babbling on like a like a, a monkey man to to reference well, they're, another they're, track? <laughs> they're new because they haven't been out before. Uh, they're old because they were recorded in '93. Is that what you mean, or are you? Is there something else to the meaning of that for you? No, no, no. I mean, I think it, it was. Um, it, like nothing took me by surprise. I'll say that, right? Like there was nothing that was completely out of left field that I was like, wow, you know, the, the smithereens should have done this as a single in, you know, 1994, right? Nothing completely left field. Um, but it's very fresh and I, I just loved hearing it, you know, because there's only so many records any band or artist can put out. Right. So Mm -hmm. this is kind of a special find, uh, you know, for fans of the band. Yes, uh, it is. And uh, so far, that's been the general consensus. The reaction we've been getting is really positive. Um, I thought it was a good record. I thought it was worth we all thought it was worth putting out. But I got to say, I'm just a little surprised and quite tickled that it is being met with such a a nice reception. It's, it's a really good feeling. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's a good feeling record too. Um, and, and it makes me wonder, um, you know, was it a, uh, I guess the question I'm going for here is, was it a difficult process for you guys at all to go back and revisit these, um, you know, and hear Pat singing I mean, I know that that's a sore spot for anybody that's lost a, a, a comrade in arms and a, and a brother, um, you know, but did, w- w- was it a melancholy experience, I guess, is what I'm ultimately getting at. Yes, to some degree, but you got to remember it's, it, uh, you know, it, 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 it stood for us, it stood alongside everything we've ever released because we've known these tracks uh, for so long. So they weren't new to us, you know. Um, it, for us, it, it's all—it's probably more of what you're saying. Probably hits our fans in that way more than us because, the, you know, we've lived with these for all these years. Um, yeah, we had, hadn't listened to them in, in a while, but uh, it, it was almost as if Pat was still here in a way when we listened to him, you know. Yeah. Well, and to your point, it's not like this was a big surprise. Like, oh, I don't remember recording that like in some, you know, (laughs) Joe Walsh. uh, (laughs) I'm now sober. I don't ever remember doing that kind of thing. I mean, you you knew they existed. So it wasn't like a a big, huge, you know, ta-da. I I get that part of it. I just wonder when you were sitting down to kind of put everything together together. Um, I, I'm sure it brought a lot of memories back is what I'm getting well, it, at. That, yeah. That's what I was going to say is that, um, we really did have a lot of fun making this right. I think that comes through. It, we really did, uh, enjoy the sessions and, uh, we were really focused, like I said before, and I think we were playing well together. And I just remember the, that whole period with great fondness. So that more than anything, what, uh, it, it brought back, um, it was just, it's a time capsule and it's, it's a period where we were just, there there was no distractions. We were really working hard and, uh, and having fun in the studio and and we were getting food delivered from little Italy every day. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Uh, and and uh, and there was a bar on the corner there when we needed to take a break. We called it Studio B. Uh, and uh, it was Larry, our engineer, and one of the studio owners, and Steve, the other owner, were great guys and fine people to work with. We had a, a great assistant, Sean Coffey, 
And uh, uh, another fella, Armando, who's actually pictured on the back cover, who sadly has passed away, but he was really helpful to us. I, yeah, a lot of memories. I can, and fortunately, I did snap a lot of pictures, many of which, um, or a, a selection of which are, appear on the cover of the album. Are you, uh, I, and just out of curiosity, are you saving up for a book, I, I hope, at some point in your, in your uh, future? Yeah, I, it's just a matter of discipline and finding the time to do it because yeah, there's a lot of a lot of photos, a lot of lore. Uh yeah, I just got it's it's on the list. <laughs> I I hear you. Well, you know, and I know you're a busy guy. I mean, gosh, you know, you guys are are still out there playing and and by the way, you know, I I do want to say this um, you know, you, you guys kind of use two different singers, um, uh, Robin Wilson from the Gin Blossoms and Marshall mm-hmm. Crenshaw, uh, who also has a connection to the Gin Blossoms. He has a co-write on one of their biggest hits. Oh, uh, that's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, but, you know, I, I'm good friends with Hess, you know, the Gin Blossoms drummer. Um, mm-hmm. Scott and I are buddies. Um, but, you know, I know you guys are playing a whole lot, too. Um you know, does this album coming out, you know, maybe some of these show up in some set lists in the future? Oh, yeah. We're planning on doing some of the tunes uh, from the Lost album in our live show for sure. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Excellent. Well, it, you know, and like I say, I know you're a busy guy, but, um, you know, when you, when I look back and I, you know, I, I've, read a lot of your interviews and I know that you've done a lot of interviews for publications like modern drummer where you're the interviewer, right? I know, Mm -hmm. I know that you have a deep appreciation of musicology. You're, um, you know, you, you have a radio show where you, um, uncover some gems and I know you, you just know a ton about, you know, everything that is music. Um, Obviously, Keith Moon, Ringo, who are some of those other really early influences for you? Hal Blaine, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, when I think back to what really uh, got me interested in rhythm, I, I think of as a kid watching American Bandstand on TV in the late 50s and early 60s and just being exposed to all the wonderful music that was on AM radio you know, at the time, uh, you know, in the early sixties, uh, in the early sixties, the twist was happening, you know, and that groove definitely spoke to me. My phone is beeping. Can you hear that? I just didn't. No, I no, still... no, it's fine. Okay. All right. I, I mean, so the twist really made a big impression on me. And the early Four Seasons records really spoke to me. And the guy who played drums on most of their hits was a New York session player called uh, Buddy Saltzman. Oh, yeah. Who, uh, yeah, a uh, fabulous studio drummer. He played on many, many hits in New York City, as did Gary Chester. Uh, so really, the earliest stuff for me was listening to I didn't know who these people were at the time, but but those records made such an impression on me. Leslie Gore records. Uh, a lot of stuff out of New York. The Drifters. Uh, just There were so many uh, killer, killer records at the time that as a kid of three or four or five years old really made an impression on me. Then, of course, Hal Blaine came along on the Phil Spector Productions and then I really loved Dennis Wilson. Now, he, Dennis actually played on a lot of Beach Boys records. He, the Wrecking Crew uh, phenomenon and the, all the attention it's, it's garnered tends to suggest, or people interpret it as, as uh, saying that Dennis didn't play, uh, that Hal Blaine played on all the Beach Boys records. It's not necessarily true. Dennis played on some real key stuff, and uh, he was a big influence on me. Um, yeah, Ringo and uh, uh, Kenny Jones when he played with the Small Faces. Oh yeah, huge. And Johnny Barbada with the Turtles. Um, uh, Earl Palmer is one of my biggest influences and inspirations. And uh, uh, Roger Hawkins, who played with the Muscle Shoals, the, the, the Swampers, the Rhythm Section. I mean, wow, 
huge. Uh, Greg Arico was sly. I'm a family stone. Oh, gee, I mean, you know, I, DJ Fontana was Elvis. Uh, you know, last night I played uh, with a group of friends of mine in New York. We did a, uh, a Procol Harum tribute show. And it, re- learning those songs reminded me what an incredible drummer and somewhat unsung drummer it was B.J. Wilson, the Procol Harum drummer, just a, a, a complete original. So I had to channel all that. He was a big influence. Um, wow. Uh, oh, gee whiz. A, a few, oh, well, of course, the Motown drummers. Al Jackson, Gene Crisman from Memphis. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on, but those are the, the ones when I was a kid that, yeah, you know, Charlie Watts, I, I, would, I, I would play along to all those records. And I just learned from playing along to those, those, those great grooves. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Well, you know, I know that, you know, you guys, um, I, I guess it would have been probably uh, mid 2000s. You guys did uh, B-sides, The Beatles, right? That was an album yep. that the Smithereens put out. What was your experience trying to cop Ringo grooves? Because there, there's there's a conversation amongst drummers, you know, and I would say for a certain generation of drummers, you ask them, you know, why did you start playing drums? And they will say, Ed Sullivan, the Beatles, period. Mm-hmm. Ringo Starr was the reason I picked up sticks. Um, mm-hmm. But there is this age old debate on whether, you know, Ringo, who was not, you know, by his own admission, a learned drummer, right? He wasn't, you know, this technical powerhouse, but I would make the argument that he actually was because he was a lefty playing a right-handed kit. And he did some stuff that there are guys now, you know, 60, 65 years later that we're still trying to figure it out. Well, I'm one of those guys. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And it's mostly for my money. It's the early Ringo, like 1963 Ringo. I thought he had technique to burn, but it was his own technique. Yeah, you can't put you certainly you could not put him up against Louis Belson or uh, or Buddy Rich for that kind of prowess. But Ringo, again, to me, the mark of what I like in a musician is I, if I like how they express themselves. Technique is one thing, and it's one thing; it's something to admire, but. It, it, it music it, to me, drumming music. It's about the success of it is how it makes you. It's based on how it makes you feel. You know, yeah. that's the most important thing. But Ringo, he did a few things that I still can't do, and it perplexes me. Like uh, uh, he does the, these incredible. Um, I guess you would call them fills or, or phrase or figure on the song. Not a second time. Uh, what, I don't even know what the technical word is for it, but where you you do the same thing with both hands. What is that called? Just unison playing. Yeah, right. Unison playing, where he's doing that on the, the snare and tom, real rapid things. Or he does similar patterns on uh, "I Want to Hold Your Hand." Very, very tricky stuff. Not to mention the piece de resistance that still coming out of the bridge on tell me why from hard to start. <laughs> nobody uh, knows what that is nobody knows what that is <laughs> well i know what it is but i know that i can't do it <laughs> right right <laughs> you know i think I, I think i was able to do it when i was really young because uh, maybe i practiced it but uh and maybe if i practiced it hard enough now i could i could cop it but it, 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 you need somebody with some measure of technique to be able to pull those things off. And it's just things that he had in his head, his phrases and, and, and musical ideas that, all right, well, I'll try, this is what I'll do here. And it was just him doing his thing. But he did, here's another great example of Ringo's uh, demonstration of, of technique. Listen to, if you go back and listen to that Star Club recording, I think it's from 62. I mean, his playing is pretty frenetic and pretty in the pocket and, and 
those wild rolls on I'm going to sit right down and cry. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but those recordings really show. It, Ringo was at that point, was he was, okay, he didn't sit down and, and study with a teacher, but he was, he learned on the job. He was the most seasoned player of the Beatles at that point. They, he had in, played with Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, and they were regulars at the Butlins Holiday Camp in, uh, in England, where you had to play all kinds of styles of music every night. So he just threw himself into it, and he was a natural. Uh, he just learned by doing. I, don't get me don't get me started about Ringo. His feel, <laughs> his yeah. feel, his feel alone is uh, something to aspire to. It's just uh, he has such humanity in the, his expression and uh, everything he did. He's just a remarkable drummer, so lyrical and musical. He and of course the ultimate song player. Plus, he swung like crazy. Yeah, you know. I, well, so, and I, and I think the argument is, you know, um, I, I think what would you do playing in the Beatles, right? Like to come well, up with the perfect part for all those songs. I don't think yeah. I could do it. Mm-hmm. Y- y- you know what I mean? It was just like all of his parts were, uh, you know, press fit. If that makes any sense, like it just fit perfectly and it was the perfect part for all those tunes so i i guess i'm trying to get in your head a little bit what was your approach doing a bunch of beatles songs that you're going to release to the world oh right okay that was your question <laughs> um well actually before we did uh besides the beatles we did meet the smithereens was which was our take on meet the beatles that came first and so well, I would say the Beatles records are certainly, if if there are any records I know inside out, it would be almost any Beatles track, maybe any Beach Boys track. So it didn't take a whole lot of preparation. It was kind of like running down the stairs to the basement when I was a kid and playing along with my favorite records, really. It was just... We got together, and when we did Meet the Smithereens, we did with the 12 tracks that comprised Meet the Beatles, we did all the tracks in one session. I think it was eight or ten hours. We oh, wow. Together. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah because it's, it's just music that we know. And, uh, yeah, it was like, I always kind of, when I played the music that I really love, which just about any music I play I love, but it makes me it's just I tap into whatever that spirit was uh, that I had when I was learning to play and, and getting excited about music. I, that I just think that's so important to maintain that and hang on to that, if at all possible, as you go on and grab everything that life throws at you. But, uh, you know. Yeah, well, and that is important. And, you know, I think... I, I I get there about 90% of the time, right? When I'm playing, like I, I can get back to that feeling of being in mom's basement, which, you know, I, and I'm sure you agree with me. Parents of drummers automatically go to heaven, no matter what yeah. else happened in their <laughs> life. Um, yeah, right. You know, I tortured my poor mom for, you know, four or five hours a day of playing along to, you know, Zeppelin and, Hendrix and Aerosmith and all that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But I can get back to that feeling pretty easy. It's the 10% of the time where maybe I'm on a gig I don't want to do or, mm. you, you know, I'm not feeling it. How do you tap into it all the time? Because I know that's your goal, right? But how do you get yeah. back to that pure joy of I, I'm in my element all the time? Well, of course, as you just said, you can't do it every gig. You might be super tired or for whatever reason, you're just not on your game. Uh, Those are kind of rare occasions, but I don't know. I just, I guess I just want to do it. I I don't have an answer of how I do it. I just want to do it. So I do it. 
you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know. I just, uh, somehow, I, I know I speak for the other guys too. I, we just, we're self-taught. So the initial fascination with music and, and wonderment about it and, and love of it and uh, music is filled with you know records great records are filled at least the ones we grew up with a lot of them are just imbued with a sense of mystery how did these sounds come together and how how does this exist and you know there, there's so many variables to the records we grew up with and it's, it's still that sense of of um of curiosity and passion that we had when we were kids. I, I don't know. It's just something I never let go of. And I think it's really great if you can hang on to it. It was just there. Yeah. I don't know, man. Yeah. Well, I, and I, I don't either. Um, I thought maybe you had the, uh, the, the keys to the kingdom on that one, but you know, yeah, I don't, when, I don't know. when I was a youngster, you know, um, I grew up in the internet age, meaning, you know, there, there was an internet by the time, about the time I graduated high school. Right. Wow. And, and oh. you know, so it was before, you know, YouTube and all those things. But, you know, when I was a kid and I wanted to learn something about, you know, one of my favorite drummers or, you know, this next new album by a certain band, you had to wait for like the cream magazine or hit parader or whatever to come out or rolling stone. You, you just couldn't find out any of that stuff. And there was mystique around the bands and the recording yep. process. Now I can probably tell you what, you know, the drummer on any given session had for lunch today. Um, yeah. and, and I think that takes some of the magic out of it. it wh what do you think? Well, yeah. You're right. Um, also, we're, we're privy now to all these isolated tracks, right? Oh, from, yeah. Uh, from this new uh, technique of, of uh, reverse engineering. I don't know what they're calling it, but it's fascinating. I, on one hand, you're right. It does demystify it and take some of the magic out of it. But at the same time, it's almost like saying mono versus stereo. Some people um, say mono only. Well, I grew up getting stereo records so I could isolate the channels and listen to what the drummer was doing as much as I could and learn from it. Um, but yes, uh, it doesn't ruin it for me because even though I'll go and buy those Beatles box sets with all the... Um, strip down takes and you, you learn how they actually put things together. Yeah. On one hand, it, it, it can ruin things for you, but I tend I listen to them. I enjoy them. Then I kind of forget about it and go back and listen to the original. And that still it inspires me. They both inspire me. Don't get me wrong, but, uh, yeah, yeah, it's like, wow. It, you're right. There was such a, an effort that you needed to make to acquire the music that you love. And in addition to just learn, in addition to learning about it, um, you know, you couldn't just pick up your phone and click on YouTube. You had to listen to the radio to hear when records were going to be released, certain records and uh, write down the release date and then, drive to the store and, and buy it. Or sometimes if you were into imports, you had to find a, a store that had import versions of, of records and, or go to garage sales and flea markets and hunt things down. So it did make it more special. There's no two ways about it. And uh, the anticipation was, uh, was a big part of it. And just going on the hunt, you know, for these things. Yeah. Uh, and also, the, when these records came out back in, I guess I'm talking mostly the 60s right now, and so to some degree in the 70s, every week on the radio, maybe even every day, there'd be some new startling sound that you never heard before uh, on your AM radio. And it made life very exciting. Uh, so it's nowadays, okay, so you might, let's talk about... Um, 
Oh, Purple Haze, for example, okay, by Jimi Hendrix. Most people know that record. It's been in our lives since 1967. Uh, or if you're younger, you, you grew up with it existing already. But back then, when, it, when you heard it for the first time, nothing like that existed beforehand. So you were having your mind blown on a regular basis <laughs> if you were living during that period and turning on the radio. And every week, there'd be some crazy new sound like it was created on a different planet or universe that had not been there before. So everything was quite fresh and new and shiny and ripe for discovery, you know. And I'm glad it's still there being dug by younger people, but it was a different experience to behold this, these new miraculous sounds that were popping out of the radio all the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I completely agree. I think that... Um, you know, I, I don't know who to credit the quote to, but I heard somebody say, and it was somebody in the music industry said, yep, nothing surprises me anymore in the worst way yeah. possible. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, you know, it, the, well, the, the old joke of, you know, you want to hear a sentence nobody's ever said before. I wonder what the new ACDC record will sound like because you already know what it's going to sound like. But mm -hmm. and not to take anything away from ACDC, but y you know what their new record is going to sound like. What you're saying is back in those days, you had no idea what was coming up next, and it was likely to blow your mind. Right. That's right. And when you heard the announcement of a new release coming from your favorite group, you just uh, you, you, you could not wait for that record to hit the stores and you would not know what new direction they might be taking. You know, it was really <laughs> it was a great lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you were always surprised. And, you know, I, I was the kid that, you know, when I heard there was a new record coming out that I wanted, I tried to mow a couple extra lawns that week. Right. Save up my nickels. <laughs> I, remember, I remember doing that. Yeah, for sure. You know, so uh, good times. Well, Dennis, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for doing this, but, um, you know, the, the Lost album, it, it's it's out now, correct? Yes, it is. Uh huh. Okay. And I'm assuming it's available, you know, wherever fine music can be found, correct? That's right. And we have a website called officialsmithereens.com. You can go there for more information. There's a web, uh, there's a Facebook page. Uh, yeah, you can find us like you find most things these days. <laughs> it's, it's another thing. It's just crazy. It's wow. It, 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 everything's at your fingertips. You know? Yeah, it absolutely is. Well, before we wrap up, I do want you to tell everybody about your radio show. You mentioned earlier that you wanted to be a DJ when you were a kid. Um, mm -hmm. you do have a radio show now, so tell everybody about that. It's a streaming show. So I'm, I'm assuming again, at your fingertips, anybody can listen to it whenever they want, right? That's correct. It's, uh, I do it, uh, it, I pre-record it and it, uh, hits the, the airwaves, the, the virtual airwaves every Wednesday, two to four Eastern time at WFMU.org. WFMU. It's the greatest radio station in the world. They also do terrestrial radio as well. But um, it, they have several uh, streams, and the one that my show, which is called Denny's Den, is on is the Rock and Soul stream. And if you can't listen on Wednesdays, it's archived, so you can tune in anytime you please. So just go to WFMU.org, Denny's Den on the Rock and Soul stream. Excellent. Well, I know you uh, you bring out some old gems um, and, and, you know, just stuff that people should know about. You know, there's a lot of great music that's been out there for years and years and years. And I say this all the time. Any recording is just a snapshot in time. Right. It's where that artist was on that day. And True. when the magic happens, you know, immediately. Right. I think so. Yes. You know, and there, there's no shortage of those magical moments. They're, 
they're all out there, you know, and they've been reissued or they've been captured. And uh, it's infinite, really, how many uh, inspired moments that have been captured on tape or shellac can still be uh, accessed and enjoyed. It's it's really it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it definitely is. Well, I'll wrap up on this note. I know you guys have dates uh, throughout 22. Um, are you still adding dates, especially with the with the new Lost album coming out? Um, how much touring are you guys going to do for the rest of this year and, and into next year? Well, we, we're we out there quite a bit. We don't uh, tour per se. Like, we're not out on a bus and hitting it every weeknight. We, we tend to do more extended weekends where we'll fly out and do one, two, three dates in a row, maybe Thursday through Sunday or something like that. So we, we're out there uh this year we're going to the we've been out to the west coast and here and there we're going to the midwest uh in november we're going to tempe arizona we're playing a big show in carteret new jersey our hometown beautiful new performing arts center there uh in early december and then next year yeah we there are things popping up on on the books, including a cruise. We're doing a, it's a first for the band, actually. We'll be doing a, a <laughs> going on a big old ship and playing. It should be a lot of fun. <laughs> well, just, just watch out for the, uh, for the waves, your, your floor, Tom, you know, make sure you got really good floor, Tom legs. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've actually played a few cruises with other folks and it's, uh, it can be interesting at times. It's usually been smooth sailing, but uh, yeah, you do have to at least prepare yourself mentally for uh, eventualities. <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, Dennis, thank you so much. Um, I, I will open the invitation now. Anytime you want to come back to the drum shuffle, I would certainly love to have you. It's been a real honor for me. I've just been such a fan of the band and your playing for so many years. This is one that I get to now you know, cross off my list and hopefully we'll get to do it again someday. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And yeah, I'd love to talk again sometime. Why not? I mean, it's, you know, we have a, uh, here in the New York area, we have a, uh, a group of, of really cool players and we, we get, well, before COVID we were getting together in person uh, a couple times a year, just a, a drum, a drum lunch, drummer's lunch, you know, that, some real great names and great people hang out and it turned into more of a zoom thing, but we still do it. We get together. Um, I don't know if you know, Joe Franco. Oh yeah. And I I happen to be on that email list. Don't tell anybody that I don't live in the city, but, but I know about the tavern on Jane and all that. So, Uh, okay, cool. That's so much fun. If you're ever in town, when we do it again, uh, please join us. And Joe actually came to, um, this Procol Harum show last night. It was so nice to see him there. He, he had a great time. So, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, I, 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 I did uh, needle drop on some of your other episodes and I saw you had, uh, actually you had Dina Toriello who uh, was also part of our drum group. Yeah. And, and I, I noticed there's a bunch of players that I'm buds with Ken Coomer. I haven't seen him in years, man. Yeah. I got a, listen to that one yeah ken's yeah. living his best life down in nashville uh-huh yeah he's he's man he's a great producer too i mean he is he's producing a lot of really good stuff down there oh that's good yeah but I gotta, uh yeah I gotta check. yeah you definitely check it out but uh you know you mentioned new york my daughter is pre-professional ballet so she's got wow. her Got her eyes on NYU, Columbia, Juilliard, you know, so we were up there in July doing some college visits, and the only person I got to see while I was there was Dina. We grabbed a cup of coffee before her uh, her Broadway gig, so uh, the next yeah. time I'm up in town, I'll look you up. Please do that. Yeah, Dina's kicking butt on Broadway. It's so great. Yeah, she's a monster player, and I, I keep telling her every time I talk to her, I'm like, when are you going to squeeze in a lesson for me? And she's like, I, I don't have time, man. I don't have time. So, But anyway, yeah. well, All right. Dennis, thank you so much, and uh, we'll talk real soon. Yeah, stay in touch, please. Will do. Thank you so much. Thank you. All Bye-bye. right, see you.
All right, guys and girls, that's going to wrap up episode 152 of the Drum Shuffle podcast. As always, thank you so much for streaming, downloading, tuning in, listening to this podcast. Uh, I can't thank you enough. It means the world to me, and we cannot produce this show without each and every one of you doing so uh, each and every week. So as I always ask, hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you use to listen to the Drum Shuffle podcast. It helps us tremendously. The biggest thing you can do to help us out is to share a link with a friend and say, hey, check out this cool drumming podcast. Uh, It costs you nothing, and it means the world to me and everybody here at the podcast. So thank you for your efforts around that. We've got a great episode coming up next week. I'm going to be joined by Jamie Wallum from Tears for Fears. Jamie's a great guy, fantastic drummer, and we had a wonderful conversation, and I know you're going to get a lot out of that. So make sure you tune in here next week for that episode as well. As always, we answer every single email that we get here at the podcast. That email address is thedrumshufflepodcast at gmail.com. Our web address is thedrumshuffle.com, and you can always find more information on me over at jamieeds.com. I hope all of you have a fantastic week out there. So until next time, may your head stay strong and your sticks never break. Cheers, everybody. Cheers.